My next guest is an icon, a living legend within the global wine industry. Mention his name at any wine function, event, tasting, and a plethora of descriptors like journalist, author, editor, and expert on wine will be positively shouted out. For decades, our guest is considered and still considered the standard one ought to attain for in terms of excellence. It gives me immense pleasure and a great honor to have on our show, Hugh Johnson, OBE. Welcome to the show, Hugh. Thank you. It's a great, real pleasure to be here. Now, Hugh, thank you for, for being on this show. I, I'd like to kick off by asking you, in 1964, you tasted a fif, uh, 1540 Steinway from the German vineyard Weinsberger Stein. And this is considered to be the oldest wine to have ever been tasted. Could you share with us that particular experience? I can certainly tell you what it was like, but I wouldn't yes. guarantee it's the oldest wine ever. I think probably somebody's tasted Roman wine um, without much pleasure, I expect. <laughs> but no, this was a lovely experience. It really was. It was a uh, uh, the bottle had been had belonged to the King of Bavaria, uh, and the uh, Wurzburg, where the, the vineyard is, is in the state of Bavaria, uh, and it had been. Um, it sold at auction. Heaven knows why anyone with a 1540 wine would want to sell it rather than taste it, but they did. And I was lucky enough to be, I was very young, I was in my 20s, and there were about a dozen of us at the opening of it, and we each got just a little bit like that. And we all thought this is going to be finished, you know, just going to be rubbish. But it was not. It was if, if, if anything, it was most like Madeira, which is kind of obvious that it was Madeiraized and it was brown, but it was sweet. And that was the thing, that it was sweet. 1540 was a famously rich, ripe vintage in Germany. They say that the, the River Rhine actually dried up. Uh, it, was that, oh. it was that hot. It's heading that way right now, actually. And <laughs> um, so this was a very special barrel of the wine. But one has to bear in mind that they didn't even have bottles for about 300 years after it was made. So it had spent most of its life in a barrel and hence evaporating and um, how much of it was the actual original run of wine rather than a top up, nobody can say. Anyway, it was alive. The thing was that it was alive. And when I thought that I had in my mouth something that had been ripened by the summer sun 400 and something years ago. I thought, well, only wine can do this. This is a unique property of wine. Um, and it was, it was a rather moving experience. And tasting notes, well, it was sweet. It was uh, old. <laughs> it, it had something German about it. I cannot say why. I mean, it certainly wasn't Riesling or anything recognizable, but I sort of felt I could believe this came from Germany. Um, and I've dined out on it, as you might say, ever since. Marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> uh, and um, you, you stand amongst a, a very few number of people in the world, I imagine, that uh, have had this, this marvelous experience that you've just uh, described to us. Well, remember, it was many years ago now. I mean, it was 50 years ago or something. So um, if that wine was still around, it would be even older now. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, now, Hugh, you have a new book that will be positively unleashed on masses of wine students, experts, and all those who appreciate wine globally. Now, this first edition of the book, Hugh, you wrote 17 years ago. And for many in 2022, this is literally their entire lifetime. For others, it's it a blink of the eye. And I can vividly recall my law professor sharing with me the wise words, the faintest handwriting on a piece of paper is worth more than the best memory when it comes to facts. <laughs> and this would, <laughs> this would certainly apply 
to the treasures within your book here. So what was the catalyst that prompted the need to update this classic book now, 17 years later? Well, I have to qualify that really. I mean, the question is a lovely one and I'm very happy to answer it, but it's not really a total update. Mm -hmm. Because the, the philosophy of the publisher, the Academy du Vin Library, is to put together really good writing about wine whenever it was done. You know, they've published reprints of 19th century books and without touching the text at all. So there was a discussion about how much of my text should be updated. And the, the conclusion was that it was all pretty good stuff already. <laughs> and, yes, and, um, indeed. You know, unless it was unless it was sort of wrong or hopelessly misleading, we leave it there, and I just write another chapter. So that is really what the book is. I mean, it's refreshed in in that way. Yes, it is refreshed because the chapters on the bubbly, the red, the white, and the sweet are just as you wrote them, and they haven't yeah. been touched at all. So, you know, what was different for you when you revised the sort of added content to this edition from the first edition? Share with us the new material. I, I, I had to agree with the publisher that the old stuff was good uh, and that it was of its time, obviously of its time, but we're not afraid of that. You know, uh, in wine, on wine in particular, opinion is opinion. It doesn't have to be the latest opinion. In fact, it, it a lot of old opinion is more worthwhile, to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, long before the era of scores and that kind of thing, which uh, I <laughs> don't follow, to say the least. Uh, so I didn't actually, you know, I, I agreed with myself, my views of that era, that earlier age. And I wrote a chapter in addition well, t saying that really, the new ch chapter justifies the old ones. Of course. I mean, um, as you said, the opinions uh, and the notes that, that you uh, took over the years was the, the structure of the book when you wrote it um, the very first time. And I'm sure there's been additions, but you wrote your, your last chapter in this book is called Digestives. Yes. And perhaps you'd like to share with us um, a little bit more insight into that chapter. Well, you know, in a way, when I would put the book together, I felt I'm rewriting the book that I wrote 50 something years ago, my first book. Mm -hmm. uh, my first book was just called Wine. It yes. came out in 1966. Uh, it survived surprisingly well, I think I can say. Um, and the structure of the new book is not dissimilar because, you know, you take red, white and bubbly, <laughs> you have a structure. The stories are completely different because I've had decades more experience. Uh, I'm, another thing I write about is trees. And I wrote a book about trees in 1971. And I came back to revise it for a new edition. 40 years later, and they said, what the, what's the difference? And I said, well, 40 years later, I think I know a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So, so it's, it's now an accumulation of all the added experience that, that um, have, have passed. Yeah, and it's sort of, I, I hope it's not so much an accumulation as a, as a, a summary. So, Hugh, you know, talking about as the years have passed and uh, it's been nearly, gosh, when you first wrote your first book and the environment that we're in now, the world's population is close to a staggering 8 billion people and the internet has revolutionized the world of information and none more so profoundly than the wine world. Oh, that's perfectly true. Nobody would deny that, and it's fascinating. But the, um, you know, people are not just reading for information. They don't read me. Well, they read my my pocket wine book, you know, the annual, which has been running since 1977. Yes. 
I've just retired from doing it again. I did it 44 times and I thought, well, isn't that enough? Well, my wife said that actually, not that. <laughs> um, so it's not You didn't think it. you'd like to bat for half a century before uh, retiring from that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm, um, you know, that's the way, I, did, I just, now I'm not read, I'm not read for information, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. You can get information off the internet and get it from many, many good reference books. Um, but uh, if, they, people, if they read me at all, it's because they like my style of writing, they like my attitude to wine, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, rather than for the latest info. And, and that's fine by me, because I don't have to revise everything at that rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, your, your, your book, you know, the, you know, let's talk about um, this, this wine report that you have and, and um, the new book that, that um, has just come out. This can now be read electronically. It can be carried effortlessly across borders. In your opinion, Hugh, what is the effect of technology, not only in the easy access of ranking towards wines, but your thoughts on the production of wines? Well, you could almost say everybody knows how to make decent wine now. Mm -hmm. uh, you could buy very drinkable, enjoyable wine from any continent, frankly, in most countries. Uh, then it comes to what you want as a wine drinker and a wine lover, in addition to just a decent drink. And this depends on your own character, personality. It depends on to a degree on how much money you've got um, and where you are in your circumstances and so forth. So it's all, um, none of it is compulsory, none of it is necessary. It's a discussion and that's why it becomes interesting, I think. The discussion between opinions and it, it all too quickly becomes a matter of judgment and scoring and which is better and if I have two wines, you know, it has happened to me that I've had been given two first clothes, first grade four down. You know, let's say I have a glass of Chateau Lafitte and a glass of Chateau Latour. And everybody would say to me, which is better? And I say, that, they're different. Don't you see it? Oh, yeah. It's a point. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're different, the vintages, the way that it's been made. Um, the calculations are, are, are enormously large. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to, talking about that, you know, about yeah. the, the, the wines you just mentioned, you know, given the timeless indicators and markers of a good wine, you know, that we've relied on, you know, but they're no longer solely confined to, oh, balance, acidity, uh, length, and intensity. There's now a multi-tiered, generational tilt that now gives more weight and consideration towards, ah, how about is there reduced carbon footprint in terms of the wine production? They're questioning if it's sustainable vineyard practices are being adopted. Is there low or even no alcohol wines being you know, increasingly produced? What are your thoughts on these, I would think, pretty seismic uh, changes in, in the wine world here? Well, they haven't much changed the kind of wine I drink, to be really frank. Mm -hmm. But how much has champagne changed with all these goings on? I mean, okay, there's the global warming, they're picking earlier, they're worried about the um, possible changes in the climate in the champagne region. Uh, how much has Bordeaux changed? Well, more than champagne, but not radically. Still recognizable, and the different districts of Bordeaux are still recognizable. Saint Emilion is one thing, uh, Boyac another. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the grape varieties are still flourishing where they were put. Uh, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't overegg this business. Of uh, you know, anybody can worry about climate change, and, and 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 we all do, but it hasn't really affected wine, and I think it'll be quite a time before it does. 
I mean, you can you can see the, the the plus side has become obvious. Germany hasn't had a really bad vintage for thirty years, and it used most vintages used to be pretty medium in Germany. Yes, um, that's the extreme case. You know, we're now growing wine in places that were marginal or, or worse than that. Uh, but um, the the, North, the wine lover who sticks to uh, the classics is not really bothered yet. And the one who wants to explore new territory has got an infinite number of possibilities to explore. Mm. And I think one of those would be the uh, increase in production and uh, uh, stature of English sparkling wine. Aha, uh -huh. no, that's a, my favorite question. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I never thought that I would uh, be really enjoying an English bubbly, and I love to call it bubbly. Yes. Uh, and, and, and comparing it with champagne, and pr in some cases, preferring it to champagne. Oh. Um, you're, you're not looking for exactly the same things. You know, we, the, the, the fruit ripens in a different way. You know? We have a cool, slightly cooler climate. Mm -hmm. touch wood um, uh, but the the character of English bubbly really appeals to me the freshness the the the, the overworld used elegance I think um, the lightness of touch uh, the sort of underlying flavor that you could relate to apples I mean don't say it tastes of apples but but, but the comparison is there all this appeals to me enormously. And in fact, to be honest, I'm opening more bottles of English bubbly than I am of champagne these days. Is that shocking? Point. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. I mean, uh, I think, you know, one, one moves with the times. And, and talking about that here, what advice would you share with members of the young and aspiring generation, like the Generation X millennials, who wish to pursue an illustrious wine writing career like the one you continue to have? Yeah, people ask me this and I just say, well, it's not, wine writing is not something separate from writing. Mm -hmm. You know, just write well, be a good writer or you won't be a good wine writer. It's all about the writing. It's all about how you come across your, your knowledge of the language, your way with words, your personality, does it come through? Uh, become a good writer and you can be a good wine writer. The technical stuff is learnable. <laughs> but it's, it, it comes from the soul, does it? Uh, it comes from the throat and the stomach and the heart. <laughs> <laughs> now here, where can one find your second edition book? You know, the, this updated version of your book. Uh, I beg your pardon. Could you repeat where, that? Where, where would they be able to buy your second edition, the updated book? Well, I mean, the the, the pat answer is any good bookstore. Of <laughs> course, of course. Uh, but uh, it's also available online. I mean, you Google it and you find it. Uh, I don't mean there, there isn't an online version. I mean, you can buy it online, buy right. the book. Right. And in future, there may well be, an, uh, there is an online version. There is also an audio version, I believe. So- Was that narrated by you? No, 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 they tried me out. I was no good. <laughs> to, oh no, a, I, I, think, a, I think that would be the, 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 the main attraction. <laughs> no, you have to have a professional. He's a very good actor. <laughs> Might I ask who, who it was? Forget his name. Isn't that awful? <laughs> okay. Well, it happened some while ago. Remember that. It yes. wasn't yesterday. Of course, of course. Now, um, will, do you believe that this book um, will be translated in time to come? Yes, I, I certainly hope so. I think the Germans are onto it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a very good market in Germany. The Germans like my stuff. Heaven knows why, but they do. Uh, the, uh, the only translated versions of any of my books I've been able to actually read are the French ones, and mm -hmm. they're fine. But I do remember being sent proofs of 
the World Atlas of Wine in Japanese, saying, please correct and return. <laughs> right. Right. And um, ha has there been any um, sort of uh, overtures towards uh, translating it towards some of the world's larger markets in the East? I don't honestly know. I mean, uh, the publisher would handle all that anyway. Of course. Of course. Uh, and probably not get overexcited and, and cable me if there was a, 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 an overture. <laughs> So due to a technical interruption, uh, we're now continuing um, and we will finish this much anticipated interview. Hugh, lovely to see you once again. And you, sir. Thank you. Now, just to carry on and pick up where we left before, there are now many new wine producing countries, previously not on the radar of many in the wine world. For example, China, yeah. India, Israel, Brazil. And I know the uh, country champion for Romania is Dr. Marinella Ardelaine. Have you tried wines from these countries and what are your thoughts about them? Yes, I think le less from China than the other ones you mentioned because um, they haven't been available frankly, in, in Europe, and um, they probably are if you make a big big effort. But uh, my colleague, Jancis Robinson, has investigated them and been to vineyards. I once went to a vineyard um, in the north of China, but that was oh, 25 years ago. And it was an investment by Rémy Martin from France. And they had a, uh, they built a rather a splendid winery around a courtyard, as though it were in Bordeaux, that kind of thing. And uh, the idea was that the grapes would be delivered in there. But then the powers that be, China being what it was then, built a, a restaurant right where the grapes were supposed to be delivered, a great big um, a, a kind of a pagoda in red and gold, which became oh. the place for all the top knobs to go. And, and there was nowhere to bring the grapes in. Right. So, so that's been your experience with um, that's, that's China. Some of the others, Israel and Bulgaria, and uh, or Romania. Yeah. And Brazil. No, we don't see much Brazilian wine. Romania, on the other hand, is a <clears throat> wine country with a very long pedigree. Yes. It, it's got ideal <clears throat> conditions for wine, except possibly politically. Um, it's had vineyards in Roman times, hence the name, I suppose. Uh, and I've had very, very respectable wines, but nothing really that you'd call exciting. Right. So where, where do you see the development of, in your opinion, of these wine producing countries? Do you think they will ever be in a position to challenge the, the current uh, world uh, sort of heavyweights of France and Italy? Well, it depends on, on the market you're talking about. I mean, for their domestic markets, they are crucial and I'm sure will be successful. If you're talking about the sort of international, um, the, the luxury market, then they'll have a very tough time getting into it. Even, I mean, Italy is not universally considered as producing wine on the level of Bordeaux's first growth and this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Although the wines are absolutely wonderful, but cracking into the, the prestige market is jolly tough. And I can't see that happening in a hurry. Hmm. So th that's, um, I, I think that that would be sad news for the Italians hearing that, uh, you know, when you think about the sort of Barolos and the Amarones and, uh, you know, the, the, well, the, the sort of super know, Tuscan. Availability has got a lot to do with it. I mean, yes. why is Bordeaux the most important prestige or luxury or even quality wine uh, producer in the world? Because it's so big. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get Bordeaux, but, you know, that is never going to be the case with Barola. Yes, yes. I, um, ma many others have um, sort of 
reflected your sentiments about supply. That's one of the main issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the country may produce great wine, but if it's not available on the shelves, it's very hard for people to make an assessment on That's that. That's right. Yeah. Now, now, Hugh, you've um, you've alluded to, you know, that if one is looking at the prestige and the sort of high end luxury level, um, you know, one cannot ignore Bordeaux, you know, the the Grand Cru's. Now, here's a thought, you know. As as wine uh, appreciation uh, moves along in the world, there's always this the elusive best. Is there such a wine? And there are thoughts of school. You know, they are more interested in looking at the horizontal level of wines as opposed to the vertical. And their thoughts on the vertical are this. You know, you're given three or four wines and you're asked to select which is the best. Being mere human beings, we always find a reason why the others are not as good as the one that's been selected. And the thought is, by doing so, we um, tend to narrow the possibilities of exploring on a, hor on a horizontal basis. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, comparisons are odious. <laughs> when, when you, if you say that you've been given two absolutely wonderful wines, or more than two, and you're asked to say which is the best, you're going to downgrade the others. Yes. Uh, you know, there can only be one winner, and that is counterproductive, to say the very least. So, so... You know, you, you've been in the, you know, you're a pillar, you're, you're part of the, the institution of wine, you know, uh, on a global scale here. Do, do you think that uh, for new wine enthusiasts, that they should perhaps consider looking at the horizontal, trying to explore more yeah. of the different wines that are out there as opposed to seeking the one champion? Well, if, if I'm ever asked, you know, where do you begin? I always say I begin with what I can easily afford. Mm -hmm. So price does enter into it from the very beginning. Uh, and you know, if you have a wine that is you're comfortable with the price, and you say, oh, I can well afford this, then you can judge it absolutely um, objectively and say, yes, this is, a, this is good for me. I'd, I'd like to go better than this, but maybe I'm happy with this, or I'd like to trade up a little bit. Um, if you head straight for the top and I think a lot of people honestly make this mistake they say yes. well I want to get to know wine I'd better have some of the best and I'll know if everyone says it's the best I better try it they're quite likely to be disappointed because they haven't learned in what way it's best what are the qualities in it that, that get it um, appreciated so I always say to people aim aim lowish um, and you're going to be satisfied or more than satisfied, then trade up. Mm -hmm. Very sound, very sound advice. Now, now, thank you, Hugh. Now, I know that uh, Tokai holds a very special place in your heart. Why is that? It's quite a long story. The, the, um, in 1989, when everybody, the whole world saw that the communist system was on the skids, and really rapidly collapsed, as we all know. Um, my great friend, Peter Vindig Diaz, my Danish, uh, one of the best winemakers I know anywhere, he and I were old, old friends, and we're both historians in an amateur kind of way. And we started reminiscing, say, well, what great wines are missing? What wines that have really established re reputations, which have been phenomenally expensive, and there was one that really stood out, and it was one that was stuck behind the Iron Curtain. And that is Hungary's Tokai. Uh, it, it was the wine that was most appreciated by the, the Russian Tsars, by the kings of Poland. You know, it was an Eastern European icon. Uh, it was hardly ever even imported in, in, into, into London, um, except by one merchant. And uh, 
it was it was virtually an unknown quantity. Um, and then uh, it became utterly debased, as almost all aspects of life were under the communist regime. People who haven't experienced communism, younger people and so on, uh, just don't know how damned awful life was uh, under the Soviet system. Everything was degraded, um, including human relations. I mean, it's not funny at all. Mm -hmm. And so wine was made as the lowest common denominator. Uh, and uh, Tokai with it, you know, they, they they produced a sort of sweet brown fluid and called it Tokai. And, and uh, that's why when, when communism was obviously about to disappear, uh, idealists like Peter and me said, wait, it's still there, the, the country's still there, the people are still there, the, the vines are still there. What happens if we go and try and make something as good as its reputation? Which is what we did. And it wasn't that difficult from within a year or so. We were making this fabulous wine. Well, thank you for sharing that story. And I must uh, share with you that when I visited Tokai, I passed uh, the particular winery that you were involved in. The Royal Tokai Wine Company. And people the say, well, Tokai. I'm royal. Uh, and I'll tell you a story about that because we were discussing with our cooperators, the, the farmers who are going to, let us make wine from their grapes, uh, what the company should be called. And I said, well, Imperial Tokai is the most famous name. And they said, uh, Imperial rubbish, they said. Hungary is not an empire, it's a kingdom. So it only became an um, empire when the Austrians got involved. And right. Them. So um, I said, okay, well, then royal, because there were kings of Hungary. Yes, they said. That is much more Hungarian. So okay, you, so thank you. you. So that's the story. <laughs> right. Now, now, Hugh, the accolades, awards, and recognition that you've gained over the decades for your immense volume of works and knowledge on wine are matchless. I mean, few can reach the dizzying heights and stature that you do have in the wine industry. You like Sir Mick Jagger, have kept on rolling with the stones, the sort of rock star of the wine world that gets better and better with each passing vintage. How would you, like vintages and future generations of enophiles, to remember you, Hugh? As a popularizer, honestly, um, not a great connoisseur. I don't think I've got a particularly fine palate or anything. I, I may have a gift for, for description, choosing original words or accurate words. But uh, the French, my French publishers have used wonderful word. I'm called a vulgarisateur, a vulgarizer. And that <laughs> means bringing, bringing the thing to the people, like the Vulgate was the original uh, that in translation of, of, of the Bible from Hebrew or Greek, it was available. Uh, and so I am a vulgarizer, and that's what I've always set out to be, to to, in, in, to widen out the, the appreciation of wine, widen out the market for wine, and indicate to people where the pleasures lie, and give my opinion of what the most exciting wines are, and how to enjoy them, and, what food to enjoy them with and sort of put the whole thing in context. And if, if I've managed to do that at all, I think I've done everybody a good turn. I think undoubtedly, undoubtedly, Hugh. So this interview, it's been extremely enlightening, incisive, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and thoughts on the wine world. And I'm sure that our audience that has been listening will have learned more about wine than when they first began listening to this uh, interview. Please comment, like, share or subscribe to our videos.